pipeline. Um, what we mean by a pipeline is really everything from drug discovery. So understanding the biology of HD, discovering what chemicals can alter it and how testing this in cells and animals and then all the way through to different stages of clinical trials in people. And just so we're all on the same page, I wanna make sure that everyone's aware of what it means when we say that a trial is in a certain phase. So a phase one study is the first step. This is usually around 20 to 50 individuals, sometimes healthy, sometimes with HD symptoms. And a phase one trial tests whether a drug is safe to give to humans. A, a phase two trial is larger. It's usually um, in the HD field around 50 to 200 people. And it also tests safety and side effects and um, how the drug is affecting the body, um, sometimes effects on symptoms. And a phase three study is the final step needed to approve a drug. And that's much larger. Usually with HD trials, it's around 200 to 800 or 1,000 people. And this is really where the key goal is to see whether the drug can help with symptoms or slow down changes that come with HD. So finally, after a phase three trial, the drug company has to go with their results to government health agencies like the FDA in the US to get approval to produce the drug so it can be given to people. I also wanna say right now that if you want to jump in and unmute yourself and ask me a question, I'm happy to answer the question as we go along. Um, but we can also do Q&A at the end. So yeah, feel free to just be like, you know, hey, I wanna ask you something. Um, so this is what the 2020 HD drug pipeline looks like. The companies and drugs are on the left. Um, the stage that they're in is on the top. Um, this is a very busy slide and you know, we're not gonna go through each of these, but there are really even more companies and drugs that I could add here. This is just a couple of months out of date probably. Um, but I, I just wanted to show this to show you that there are, are truly dozens of companies working on Huntington's disease right now. And many are running clinical trials, um, are planning them in the next few years. And really the largest area of focus right now, I would say, is Huntington lowering. So before I... Uh, Mira, talk, yeah. Real quick, I just wanted to, to just mention that that slide looks much different than it did in years past. The amount of research that's being done is like, I mean, what, I mean, Dr. Nance, Nina, this is like by far multiplying faster than, I mean, every time I go to convention, this is just becoming more and more exciting to see. So I just want to yeah, wow. it's totally true. And we have, um, I didn't include it tonight, but my, my colleague, Dr. Yorling has this slide that's like, you think 2020 is bad. Look at what the HD drug pipeline <laughs> looked like 10 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, there were like a couple of, there are four things. Nothing was really getting at the, the, the core of HD genetically the way things are. And there's just a lot of this explosion of, of stuff. And yeah, I just um, had to mention really that cool. from, for totally. some of our guests. Yeah, this is huge. Mm -hmm. so this is, um, may I also mention, this is Noreen Hoff to low folks, that I, I feel like what's going on right now with COVID to some extent is educating people in the difference between phase one, phase two, and phase three. So I think we're increasing a, a basic understanding, although you know, it's always good to re-educate, but I, I feel like I understand more. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, I always go through those phases just in case folks haven't heard of it, but hopefully, you know, when clinical trials are important to everybody, <laughs> then we'll be as educated as possible. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about Huntington lowering specifically. These are those genetic treatments that are really trying to get at the the real problem in an HD, the, the, the gene. So um, before I talk about, um, about Huntington lowering specifically, I just um, wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about genes and Huntington. So our genetic code, our DNA is made up of nucleotides. Um, we represent these with the letters A, G, C, and T. Many thousands of these letters make up a single gene, sometimes millions. Um, there are many millions of, um, of letters in our DNA code for each person. So Huntington is the one gene that's altered in HD. Everybody in the world has Huntington and everybody in the world has repeats of this CAG sequence. Now, most people have around 20 repeats and about 10 to 26 is typical, but we know that more than 40 always leads to HD. 
there's some variability. So sometimes it can be 35 and above, but we know that HD is caused by too many CAG repeats in this Huntington gene. So to go back for just a second to middle school biology, um, where many of us learned that DNA, our genetic code, is turned into an RNA message, which then becomes a protein. So we have a Huntington gene, becomes Huntington RNA, and then Huntington protein. And proteins are the machines that run everything in our cells, DNA, RNA, protein. So I like to think about our DNA like a cookbook that contains everything we could possibly want to cook. The RNA is like an individual recipe and the protein's the food that comes out. So here are my examples, cupcakes. And if you have one tiny mistake in your cookbook that happens to be in this cupcake recipe. So say the, say the cookbook tells you to add a tablespoon instead of a teaspoon of baking powder. So maybe this is a precious old family cookbook. You don't wanna drip anything on it in the kitchen and you make a copy of your cupcake recipe. You bring it to the kitchen, you follow the instructions and then you come out with these big exploded cupcakes, which are, you know, they do the job, they're cupcakes, but they don't taste great as great. Um, and to go with that analogy, in HD, we have this CAG repeat in the DNA, this mistake in the cookbook, which ends up in the RNA, the copied recipe. And then we come out with this extra long Huntington protein, these exploded cupcakes. So people with HD have one copy of the gene from mom and one from dad. So there is some healthy Huntington and some um, expanded Huntington. And what we know is that this expanded, um, sometimes known as mutant Huntington, it can perform okay for a while, often for decades, but um, it's harder for it to fold into the right shapes to do its job. And Huntington has many jobs in the cell. Um, it can slow things down, it can clump up in cells and become toxic and cause neurons, our brain cells, to get sick and to eventually die. And when a lot of that happens, when a lot of these cells are lost, is when people start to have difficulty with memory and mood and movement and all of the things that come along with HD. So the idea behind Huntington lowering is really just to get rid of some of that toxic that toxic protein that's not doing its job well. So the way I like to talk about it is how do you get rid of the bad cupcakes? Um, and you can imagine that there are different ways to approach this, right? You could you know, correct the cookbook itself so that you're never making a bad copy again. You could um, crumple up that bad recipe that you had, or you could make the cupcakes and then throw them away. And so this is kind of a good um, analogy for the different ways that researchers are approaching this. Um, but all of the approaches in clinical trials today are focused on the Huntington RNA. So essentially trying to eliminate that bad recipe. So the body's making less of that mutant Huntington protein, less of these weird cupcakes. So, um, since people with HD also have healthy Huntington from their, their parent that wasn't affected, some therapeutic approaches are to throw out all of the cupcakes, both good and bad. And some focus on just trying to get rid of the bad cupcakes, the mutant Huntington. And in general, how these drugs work is that the drug is, um, it's sometimes like a, a man-made piece of synthetic RNA or DNA, um, sometimes a small, uh, like a small chemical, but in general, they're designed to stick to a part of the Huntington RNA um, stick to that recipe and either trick the cell into not using or destroying the recipe because it's not readable, or the drug might cause the recipe to be chopped up. But in general, the goal is to um, have less of this recipe so that less of the harmful Huntington protein is made. Um, and clinical trials are testing first, whether this is safe in humans, whether these drugs can actually do what they're meant to, lower Huntington. Um, and third, and most importantly, whether this could slow or stop the uh, progression of HD symptoms, whether it could stop HD from getting worse. And here's another um, very jargony, um, busy slide, but these just uh, so you're aware are some of the companies that are working on Huntington lowering. So George and I uh, went through and kind of made this list um, very recently, just a few days ago. And uh, again, I just want to emphasize that there's really unprecedented activity in the pharmaceutical industry around creating genetic drugs for HD, and they're using lots of different approaches, and there's a lot of um, very healthy competition and collaboration that is very exciting. And a few of these uh, drugs are studies that are already, um, that are already in clinical trials. 
Um, there are two companies, Roche and Wave, that are testing ASOs. And um, those are antisense oligonucleotides, but we're just gonna call them ASOs. And these are genetic drugs delivered via spinal injections. Um, and there is also a company called Unicure that is testing um, a gene therapy that's delivered by a brain surgery, a one-time brain surgery. And Novartis uh, has just announced a few weeks ago that they'll be testing an oral drug. And the, uh, the idea of a pill is kind of like the holy grail of Huntington lowering. So um, what I wanna do is just summarize the latest news about each of these trials. So um, Roche, which is known as Genentech in the US, is testing their Huntington lowering ASO, which uh, aims to lower the amount of total Huntington, both good and bad. And they're conducting a phase three trial right now called Generation HD1. And uh, this is the therapy that is furthest along in the, in the pipeline right now. So there are uh, nearly 800 people participating at more than 100 sites in 18 countries, and this trial recruited in absolutely record time. Uh, Roche has shared with us that it was their fastest recruiting trial. And I don't mean like an HD trial or a rare disease trial. I mean that in like the history of this huge company, this was the fastest recruitment of any trial, which really speaks to the strength and the engagement of this community in research. So everyone in this trial is going to participate for two years. Not everyone can begin at once, of course. So they began recruiting, um, uh, I think about a year ago, and now everyone is recruited and everyone will receive, is receiving spinal injections and undergoing evaluations every two months at different study sites. And Roche recently announced that they expect to be able to share the trial results in 2022. And this trial, this phase three trial is really the test as to whether this drug can help slow down the symptoms of HD. Their earlier trials did show that it could lower Huntington, but whether that's really going to be meaningful in people is, um, is what this trial is testing. Now, Wave Life Sciences is conducting two trials of two different ASO drugs also delivered spinally, and these are monthly spinal injections. And these trials are called Precision HD1 and 2, and they're both testing um, safety and ability to lower the harmful Huntington protein while keeping the, the healthy Huntington intact. And this is what distinguishes Wave's approach from Roche's approach. Because of the way that they target just the, um, the mutant Huntington, both of these drugs would only work in a certain percentage of people, uh, together around 70%. Um, and these people have to have a particular feature in their HD gene. So a spelling difference kind of between the two copies of Huntington for mom and dad, and the drug can only find the, the, the bad Huntington. Um, so last, uh, last year, it was, in, it was right around Christmas last year, Wave announced that their um, initial results of one of these trials, uh, but so far these drugs have been uh, safe and well tolerated and seem to be showing pro uh, promise for lowering Huntington but they did decide to add a higher dose group of participants. And they announced just a couple of weeks ago that the full results from both studies are expected in 2021, um, actually the first quarter of 2021. So really just in the next few months. Um, they're also planning a third study, which would increase the percentage of people that could receive this kind of treatment. So this is an earlier treatment. This is a phase one, two study. And if successful, they would move on to a phase three. Um, so Unicure has begun this year, the first ever gene therapy trial for HD. And gene therapy is a little different from, this, uh, from these ASOs, which have to be continuously delivered because it's introducing genetic material into a person's cells. Um, and essentially the cells in the brain in this case become a little factory. So they, they are delivered by a virus and that virus is harmless but viruses are really good at getting inside of our cells. And so it basically creates a little factory that's kind of producing the antidote. And the idea is that this approach would be a one-time delivery, a single brain surgery. The drug is called AMT-130. And again, it is a microRNA, which basically means that it can stick to the Huntington RNA and it can stop the Huntington protein from being made. And um, this, uh, this trial is in progress. I think I have an, yes, I do have another slide. So um, this is a, an early phase trial. 
it's really a safety trial. It's very small. There's 26 people that will be participating. There is still some recruitment going on. Um, sorry about if you hear some toddler screams. That's because I have an opinionated toddler. <laughs> um, so this, yes, this trial is ongoing now. Um, and what we know most recently is that the first two patients had surgery in June of this year. And because they're moving very slowly and as safely as possible, they waited 90 days before anyone else had the surgery. And there were no dangerous side effects at that time. And then we just heard that the next two participants had surgery in October. Um, and again, I've put a HD trial finder here, um, and I'll talk a little more about that later, but you can follow along with any of these recruiting trials and just kind of take a look at what's happening, where, where they're happening um, at any time if you want more information. So Novartis just announced at a conference a couple of weeks ago that they are planning a trial of a drug that has the potential to lower Huntington when taken by mouth. And this drug is called Braniplam, and it was actually developed for a disorder called spinal muscular atrophy, which is usually fatal in very young children. And this is kind of an amazing story. Um, in doing a large screen of lots of chemical compounds and working with another HD foundation called CHDI, they discovered that Braniplam could also lower Huntington. And so they began testing it in HD cells and HD mice, and eventually they were able to um, get consent from these families to test samples from, from these children that were taking Brandaplam in a trial. And they found that their Huntington levels were also lower. So Novartis um, very recently, based on that um, information, um, they received orphan drug status, which basically is a set of incentives that the government gives to companies working on rare diseases. Um, and they are going to be testing it in adults with HD. So they're testing it now um, for safety in a small group of healthy adults. And they say that they're expecting to launch a phase two trial for HD patients in the second half of next year. Um, I don't have any information yet about locations or eligibility or really anything about the trial, but I wanted to share this because the potential for an oral Huntington lowering drug is very exciting. And I do have to mention that there are other companies that are planning clinical trials of oral Huntington lowering drugs soon, including PTC Therapeutics. And, you know, there, we saw that list a couple of slides back and there's, there are um, other companies working on a similar approach. So very cool. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but it's really just kind of like a graphic that we put together that might be helpful for comparing um, the different genetic therapies and clinical trials right now. So there's um, drugs delivered via spine, brain surgery, potentially a pill, and which phase they're all at. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but um, yes, okay. Um, and some of them are lowering total Huntington, some of them um, just mutant Huntington. Um, these, these, this, these trials have completed recruitment. Unicare is ongoing and Novartis will be uh, recruiting pretty soon. So those are, that's the main news about Huntington lowering, but it's, it's not the only approach to researching treatments for HD. Um, and there are many companies developing drugs that focus on other aspects of HD biology or are designed to treat uh, very specific symptoms. So I'm going to briefly summarize the ones that are recruiting now, as well as uh, the most recent news that we have about results and plans. I'm happy to go into more detail about any of these if anyone has questions, but I thought I would start with a little summary. Um, so there's a company called Neurocrine that is testing a new drug to treat chorea. This is called, uh, this trial is called Connect HD, and the drug valbenazine is kind of similar to tetrabenazine or Osteto, if you've heard of those. Um, which are specifically for HD Korea. Um, and this drug, valbenazine, is uh, already approved for a different movement disorder, which is called tardive dyskinesia. And people with TD experience um, involuntary movements of the face and limbs that are kind of similar to the, to the movement, the Korea movements that are experienced by people with HD. Um, so this study is trying to test whether this drug could be useful for that too. And um, it's recruiting 
adults with HD at like 50 sites in the US and Canada for a short uh, 12 week trial. Um, there's a company called Prelenia that is doing a large uh, phase three trial of a drug called Predopidine. And Predopidine was tested in a phase two trial a couple of years ago in people with HD, um, but it didn't, that trial did not meet its key clinical goals. Um, but it was, the drug was safe and it did seem to show some promise um, in sort of secondary um, goals. So it, it seemed to be helping people with HD to maintain um, daily functions. So this is a larger and longer trial that's gonna involve um, almost 500 people um, who will take predopidine for a longer period of time, about 18 months to see if it can help when given for longer. And this was just announced two weeks ago that it has begun recruiting. Um, I think it's only at a couple of sites, but um, those again will continue to appear on HD Trial Finder um, and on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, there's also a company called Annexon that is uh, conducting a small phase two trial of their drug, which is called ANX005. <laughs> um, and this drug targets a part of the immune system that might be overactive in the brain during HD. And the aim here is to try and preserve synapses, to preserve the connections between brain cells. This is a small study with 25 people at, uh, I think, eight sites in the US. Um, actually, you can see the ones recruiting now in blue at the bottom. Um, this trial is for people who have either pre-symptomatic HD or early diagnosed HD. And it's an open label study. So everybody involved receives the drug. And it's a 12 week treatment period with uh, follow-up visits for six months. And HDSA is pretty excited about this particular trial because it came out of some work that we supported um, by Daniel Wilton at, um, at Harvard Mass General. Um, and yeah, the, the work that he did um, during his uh, HDSA funding led to um, the in part the formation of this company in the, in the beginning of this uh, clinical trial. So that's, that's exciting for, for us and everyone. So those are the trials that are currently recruiting participants in the US. Those are like the large drug trials um, or the company drug trials. And I also uh, wanted to share some recent news updates about trials that have finished um, and either these companies have released results or they have plans for moving forward um, so a few weeks ago, Azavan Pharmaceuticals announced that their phase two trial called STARE uh, was successful and their drug was specifically aimed at uh, treating aggression and irritability in people with HD who experience difficulty with um, aggressive or angry outbursts. Um, and they are now planning a larger phase three trial around this specific symptom with this drug. Uh, Sage Therapeutics has a drug that they hope to use uh, to treat cognitive impairments, so thinking problems in HD. And they just announced that it was safe in a, a very small, uh, very short phase one trial. So it was six HD patients taking the drug for a couple of weeks, um, but they're now developing a larger study to hopefully move forward with this. Uh, Vasinex also just announced the results of um, the phase two signal trial of a drug called Pepinimab for HD. And unfortunately, uh, this trial did not meet its key clinical goals. So it didn't ultimately show a benefit for people with HD. So this has been a very condensed summary. So again, it's a lot, it's a lot of different things. So again, I'd be happy to answer questions or chat about any of these if you, if you wanna talk about these trials or the results. Um, and I encourage you to check out hdtrialfinder.org and hdbuzz, and there's really nice summaries of all of these recruiting trials and news around them. Um, so now I wanted to move on uh, to observational research because HDSA and uh, probably lots of people in HD research are always harping on the importance of observational research that doesn't involve a drug. So join and enroll mm -hmm. HD. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit more about why that is and use some examples um, and enroll in particular. I imagine that folks are probably familiar with Enroll. I don't know if this is the case, but so maybe I can kind of skip through these a little bit, but Enroll is this huge global study of now up to 20,000 people with, with HD open to anyone in an HD family. Um, 
no one needs to know their gene status, um, pre-symptomatic, highly symptomatic, at risk, it, it's anyone in an HD family. And it involves just an annual visit with different kinds of exams and questionnaires and giving samples. Um, and essentially the, the main goals of this are to help increase how we understand HD in people. Um, and it's really important to think about how symptoms appear, how they change over time, um, and help to improve how clinical trials are recruited and designed uh, to study the best clinical practices for caring for people with HD and ultimately accelerating drug discovery and development. So Enroll helps to do that for a couple of reasons. And one is that there are so many thousands of people being evaluated in the same way, which really makes for this very robust set of data that includes the experience of so many individuals who all experience HD differently. And this huge set of data is super attractive to scientists and to companies, and it's made available for them to explore if they have a legitimate question. And this also creates a database of, of people who are already willing to volunteer for research studies. So in roles like this big welcome mat for researchers, it's a magnet for all these companies. But I, I really wanted to show some examples because I can say all day that it's accelerating research, but like, how is this, how is Enroll actually pushing forward new ideas and new approaches to medicine and HD? Um, so first of all, we sometimes get questions from people who are wondering, well, being an Enroll get me into a clinical trial of a drug, or do I need to be an Enroll to participate in a clinical trial? And the short answer is no, but Enroll participation can drive the selection of study sites for pharma companies. So here's an example. Uh, Roche was doing this small natural history study, um, which was an observational study that they did before they began, or they began it before they began Generation HD1. And often companies will select sites in places that um, have clear HD populations, are on, you know, on coasts, or have just are in areas where there's going to be a lot of people. But you can see here that also on here is Kansas. And, um, you know, I'm not, you know, not maligning Kansas in any way, but why would a major pharma company do um, a trial of a rare disease in Kansas? And the reason is that this site had, has up to 300 people participating in Enroll. So in general, um, Enroll is helping to drive, uh, to drive companies to places where there are already experts in HD, already people involved in HD research. So HDSA always encourages participation um, in, in part because it, incre it could increase the chances of participation in a drug trial, but also because this, this research is very important and because it's a great way to be seen yearly by experts who are already involved in, in HD research. Um, so Enroll HD is also focusing on uh, pre-symptomatic HD in a way that's uh, hopefully going to allow for trials of people who are pre-symptomatic. And of course, the goal of, you know, all HD medical research is to make it so that people never get symptoms. But it's very, very difficult to test uh, a drug when, whether a drug is working before a person has, has gotten any symptoms. Um, and so part of what Enroll is doing is using those kinds of samples collected and understanding better how the biology changes, what is changing in our bodies and our brains and our blood before someone gets sick. Um, and so then if we can monitor that and show that a drug can change that and make it better, then that's a way to show that a drug is working before someone gets sick. And so this is why Enroll is sort of trying to shift uh, recruitment towards people who are pre-symptomatic and towards youth um, because it's been really informative in that way. So uh, another thing that uh, Enroll and other observational research studies have made possible is to start asking the question of why different people experience HD symptoms at such different times of life, even if their uh, genetic mutation is the same. So why did Aunt Ellen get sick when she was 55, but mom got sick at 40? And a lot of us have probably seen this graph, which shows that people with longer CAG repeats in their HD gene tend to get HD symptoms earlier. But 
with uh, typical CAG repeat lengths for HD, there's a huge amount of variability. So in this graph, every little gray circle here is a different person. And these people in red and these people in green um, all had 42 CAG repeats. But these folks with the green dots had symptoms at around 70. And these folks who are the red dots had symptoms around 40. And what researchers have done is to say, OK, let's compare all of these people with the same number of repeats and see what other genetic differences do they have and how does this affect the age of onset of HD. And if they can understand the biology behind what's different in someone who gets HD at 40 versus 70, then they can try and harness that biology um, to design therapies that will delay symptoms. And in the past few years, scientists have compared the entire genomes, all of the DNA from tens of thousands of people in, in, in studies like Enroll. And <clears throat> they've figured out sets of tiny genetic variations, one letter spelling changes in other genes that can make a difference in when HD symptoms come on. And one place where they found, sorry, is there a question? Oh, no, just a noise. <laughs> And um, one place where they found a lot of tiny variations making a really big difference was in genes that are involved in DNA repair. So we sometimes think of our DNA as very stable, but actually that, that cookbook is being taken off the shelf and it's being read and copied um, all the time. And our DNA gets damaged all the time while our bodies are doing normal things like um, copying DNA, replicating cells, and breathing, and being in the sun. And there's a set of machinery in our cells that's devoted to making sure that any damage to DNA gets fixed. And sometimes this machinery makes little mistakes, um, but tiny genetic differences can make some people's DNA repair machinery a little bit more prone to certain mistakes. And normally this is totally fine over the course of a lifetime, but in HD these mistakes can sometimes cause CAG repeats to get even longer over time in certain cells um, in the brain, also in the liver, but mostly in the brain. And this, this phenomenon is known as somatic instability, this CAG repeats getting longer in some cells. So what this actually means is that a person who has 42 CAG repeats at birth, um, they're, if you know, we're, we're not testing folks at birth, but um, the blood tests would show 42 CAG repeats, as they age, certain cells can start to develop this higher CAG repeat count. So when they're 50 years old, they might have a blood test that would still show 42 repeats, but some of the cells in their brain and other parts of the body might have 50 or 60 or hundreds of CAG repeats. And there's um, some consensus among researchers that this could be causing neurons to get sick faster. And because of studies like Enroll, we know that um, this can happen faster in some people than others due to differences in DNA repair. We know exactly what genes are causing it. And because we know that, there are researchers and companies that have begun to develop drugs to counter that, to kind of put a wrench in some of that faulty DNA repair machinery to try and stop the CAGs from expanding in hopes that this could delay the onset of HD. And several oh, companies... Are. Yeah. Hi, this is Noreen again. Uh, uh, could you go back to the slide before, please? Absolutely. So this next one is there? No, that one. Thank you. So was there any indication that as the repeat expansion occurs, that symptoms accelerate? So that's yes. So that that is uh, you mean, do they does the person experience them faster. I think most of the research actually has been on timing of when they occur. Um, there may have been a very recent paper about the speed at which symptoms occur. Um, but because these expansions are happening in the same cells that seem to be getting sick in HD in the brain, um, that, is, that is where all of this comes from. That researchers have now think that, that this expansion is kind of accelerating the cells getting sick. So yeah, I don't know about- more, more onset than, you know, increases or, you know, the 
yeah, the increased symptoms. Right. And there, so what I was going to say in the, in the next slide is that these, these companies have kind of sprung up around this and, um, one of them is called Triplet Therapeutics, and they are actually doing a study right now to kind of study that phenomenon that you're asking about, Noreen. Is it, you know, does do the symptoms happen faster? Do they come on earlier? Um, and they've begun, they've begun uh, also an observational clinical trial, which um, for now doesn't involve a drug, but they have developed a drug and they're trying to better understand this, this expansion phenomenon um, and figure out when's the best time to give this type of drug. And this study is happening now at uh, several locations. Um, it's a two-year study with uh, seven visits. There's gonna be uh, imaging and uh, blood and spinal fluid draws and different kinds of physical and thinking tests. And really it's to understand better how symptoms change as CAG repeats change. Um, so this, really this company and this study is an example of how an observation that was made possible only because there are so many thousands of people participating worldwide. Um, how this became within just a few years, something that's actually being pursued as a drug target. So when we say that enroll is important for speeding drug discovery, this is, this is the kind of thing that we mean. Um, there are also studies that are building on enroll. So Genentech's doing a study right now called HD Constellation. And this is an attempt to get even more info about other aspects of people's health um, and tie it to the onset of HD symptoms. So this is a study for folks age 12 and up who are already participating in Enroll and have tested positive for the HD gene. Um, and it just involves giving consent and saying who your doctors are and they uh, will pair health records um, with the data collected in Enroll. This is all anonymous. If you're an Enroll participant and wanna learn more, um, this is at picnichealth.com slash HD Constellation. Um, I just thought I'd mentioned that. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I wanted to focus mostly on the things that are being tested in humans right now, but I, I like to kind of wrap up just by mentioning some hot topics because there's a lot of interesting ideas and techniques that scientists are excited about and that could contribute to the HD therapies of the future. So um, I just talked about this concept of slowing CAG re repeat expansion, and the ultimate goal would be to shrink CAG repeats. Um, so it's likely that within the next few years, you're going to hear a lot more about somatic, uh, somatic instability, this, um, uh, this expansion of CAGs and how to counter it. Um, there's also lots of scientists and companies working on uh, the cookbook itself. So instead of focusing on that RNA message, that recipe, um, researching ways to correct the, the actual HD mutation itself um, once and for all in cells through gene editing. So you may have heard of CRISPR um, or other techniques. And these have um, been very useful for scientists to, to better understand the HD gene, to study different aspects of HD and uh, what happens if the HD is gene is gone or mutated in certain ways. CRISPR is not right now a drug, uh, it's a technique, so it's not really um, likely something that could be safely used in human brain disorders in the very near future, but it's definitely under intense investigation and there are HD scientists working on safety and different ways to, to do that. Um, and finally, uh, a really important development in HD research in the past decade has been the use of human adult stem cells to study HD. So scientists can take a skin sample from a person with HD and use a special set of chemicals to basically reset it back to a, a stem cell state. And uh, it can become any type of cell using another set of chemicals. So you put more chemicals on it to turn them basically into neurons. And then you have these brain cells growing in a dish. Um, and this has been super useful for studying HD in human cells without, of course, those same ethical issues that surround the study of embryonic stem cells. So those are some hot topics. And um, finally, I'm just gonna leave you with uh, the resources that we've got and that others have got for staying up to date with uh, HD research news, where to find out more about participating if you choose. And I have to plug HD Trial Finder. It's HDSA's Clinical Trials Mastering Service. It's a website and a call center that is staffed by trained navigators. Um, we list only currently recruiting HD trials in the US and Canada. You can just browse them to see what's going on in the US. 
you can enter some basic medical information about yourself or someone you know to see uh, what trials near you you're eligible for. And in addition to the drug trials that I talked about tonight, um, HC Trial Finder is also listing all sorts of local and observational studies, um, everything from testing a new kind of brain imaging method to trying a physical therapy regimen or combinations of medications, um, signing up to donate uh, your brain after you pass. And there's a lot more on there. And these studies are also really important for supporting HD research and care. They can also help um, help people develop relationships with the teams and experts that are involved in and committed to HD research. So um, you're welcome to check out HD Trial Finder. And uh, I just want to plug again a couple ways that uh, you can stay up to date on HD research. HDBuzz.net uh, is a site where scientists write about HD research in plain language. Um, uh, HCSA's newsfeed and Facebook page. You'll find updates there about research. Uh, we host webinars. Our research blog is um, a weekly roundup of what's going on in HD research. Um, again, I encourage you to check out enrollhd.org and hdtrialfinder.org. And yeah, finally, um, I just want to thank you all for watching. Um, yeah, for being here tonight. I, I really want to emphasize that HD research and especially clinical trials are, are very much a collaborative effort between the researchers and the community and the better informed we all are about what's happening, the more everyone's voices can be heard. So whether or not you or somebody you love can actually participate in these trials, um, learning itself is really a form of advocacy. So Thanks very much for your time and your attention. And I am happy to keep chatting and answer any questions you have. Well, that was outstanding. That's a huge amount of um, uh, research that you summarized beautifully in less than an hour. So um, um, 